Zimbabwe is a country that is richly and abundantly endowed with countless natural resources, including boundless flora and fauna. Africa as a whole has a combined elephant population of over 450,000, with Zimbabwe currently hosting the second largest elephant population in the world, only after Botswana. To be precise, Zimbabwe has an elephant population of over 100,000, twice the country's sustainable carrying capacity of 45,000. More than half of those Pachydims live in and outside the unfenced wine, a wildlife park nearly half the size of Belgium, with some 14,600 square kilometers, that is 5,637 square miles of vegetation. Here elephants roam freely from Zimbabwe's sprawling unfenced game reserves, and it is common to find heads crossing or resting along the main highway from Wango to the nearby prime forest resort of Victoria Falls. Welcome to Hericom Media, the home of Quebec Classics. In today's documentary, our story is the plight of the Zimbabwean elephant. Today we are at Anlo Park in Gweru, Zimbabwe, about 300 kilometers southwest of the Zimbabwean capital, Harare. Welcome to Hericom Media, the home of Quebec Classics. Your story, our story. Today we are going to see the interaction between men and nature. The interaction we see here mirrors and epitomizes the close relationship and harmonious coexistence between men and nature. Chinese President Mr. Xi Jinping once said, human beings should take nature as their roots, respect nature and conform to nature. Can you tell us how long does uh, an elephant take to give birth? In other words, how long is the gestation period of an elephant? Okay, cool. Um, their gestation period is 22 months. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. And um, I can also add on that. And, uh, they can feed for 18 to 20 hours a day. And how many kgs do they consume like of food, solid food per day? Actually, they eat 5% of their body weight. How about water per day? Water per day, they can take something like 150 to 200 liters a day when they are full grown up. That's amazing. Now, when it comes to uh, the lifespan of an elephant, uh, how long does an elephant, I mean, uh, how long do they usually live? Okay, um, actually, their life expectancy in the world is 55 to 60 years. And then in captivity, that's um, 80 to 90. Um, the life of an elephant is governed by their molars. Actually, they have six sets of molars, which means if they can lose the last set, they can die through starvation. So what they do actually, uh, when they lose the last set, they can go and look for the swamp areas. Mm -hmm. That's the only place they can survive. For a short period, then they will die in the swamps. Wow. Yeah. Amazing. Now, uh, we have read stories that uh, there are two small animals, very small animals, that elephants are afraid of. Uh, is it true that uh, elephants are afraid of ants and bees? <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, elephants, they are afraid of bees, not ants. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Actually, uh, if you can go to uh, the areas where there is a lot of elephants and where they are farmers, they can also put beeves around their fields so that when the elephant came close they can be afraid of bees oh yeah very very funny very very funny last but not least uh we have heard that elephants hug their trunks to say hello to each other that's true actually elephants they have different commun communication sometimes they can hug their trunk or they can rub each other Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, beautiful. Uh, anything else, Gerald, that you want to say 
about uh, these uh, beautiful and giant uh, party gym, party gyms. Okay, um, actually, these guys they are more intelligent and also they are very smart, right? Um, elephants they play a vital role in ecosystem. Mm. Actually, um, we can say they are more destructive, especially on vegetation, but they are also good at seed dispersal. Wow. Both like uh, they have poor digestive system, which means if they can eat the seed of any type of a tree, these guys, you know, um, like I said, they have poor digestive system, those seeds will come out undigested from their dung, and they will also start to germinate. And we also have uh, birds like frangolins. They also come to look for those seeds on their diet. So by looking uh, for those seeds, they'll be spreading manure on the ground. And they are also eco-engineers. Mm. Yeah. So Zimbabwe's growing elephant population has presented the country with a myriad of problems. One of the problems that Zimbabwe has had to grapple with regarding the elephant population is poaching. Nearly a decade ago, poachers used cyanide to slaughter more than 135 elephants for their ivories in and around Zimbabwe's Wange National Park. In the wake of these poisonings, the Southern African nation tightened its laws to prevent similar deadly attacks on its elephants. There is a flourishing illegal trade in ivory in which international syndicates fund poachers to kill elephants and sell off their ivory tusks. The ivory is then smuggled overseas, where there is a demand for ivory for jewelry and trinkets. A Reuters report in June 2007 revealed the large quantity of illegal wedge ivory entering the United States from China and Japan is a sign of the strong demand that is contributing to an alarming increase in elephant poaching in Africa, a conservation group said. There is more wedge ivory for sale in the United States of America than anywhere else in the world except for Hong Kong, said Care for the Wild International which surveyed thousands of retail outlets in 14 U.S. cities. The group presented its findings at the Hague meeting of the Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species, CITES, widely credited with stemming the slaughter of the African elephant by imposing a ban on international ivory trade in 1989. The ivory trade came to a virtual halt after the ban, but has since revived. Experts say the killing of the elephants for their tasks, mainly in Central Africa, has reached the levels not seen since 1989 because of the Asian-run crime syndicates. China, Japan and Thailand, where possessing ivory objects is a matter of prestige, are the most important markets for illicit shipments from Africa. Over the years, the rapid increase in the elephant population in Zimbabwe has resulted in the increased habitat destruction and habitat loss, changes in vegetation structure, and an increase in human and wildlife conflict. Competition for food and water in the dry season has resulted in conflicts among the animals and with the humans. We don't sleep in our homes at night. We stay awake trying to keep away the elephants that are coming for the little crops we have, said Mangwana, one of the villagers in the mostly affected areas. In 2022 alone, more than 50 people are believed to have been killed by wild animals in Zimbabwe. But how has Zimbabwe as a country tried to strike a balance between its sprawling elephant population sustainable environmental management and its human population. We approached the country's parks and wildlife management body to hear about how they have managed and the challenges they have been facing. Um, thank you very much. Uh, today we have uh, Mr. Tenashe Farao. Uh, he is the head of uh, corporate communications for the Zimbabwe Parks and Wildlife Management Authority. Uh, we are here to talk about the plight of the Zimbabwean elephant. Mr. Farrell, uh, thank you very much for coming to uh, Herico Media, the home of Kwedu Classics, where we say your story is our story. Today, our story is uh, the plight of the Zimbabwean elephant. 
Now, um, Mr. Farrell, uh, what is the official population of the Zimbabwean elephant? Okay, uh, thank you very much. And uh, thank you for having me. And uh, good day to your viewers and your listeners. Um, as it our last census, our official elephant population was uh, at 83,000. And the last census was done in 2014, and we last did another one last year. The results are yet to be published. So that was the official census. But uh, during that census, it was showing that uh, the elephant population was growing at an average of about 5% per annum. So if you do your maths from 83,000 to where we are now, which is almost 10 years, you know that uh, we are sitting at uh, plus or minus 100,000 uh, in terms of the population. Uh, we have four main elephant ranges in this country, which is Northwest Matabeleland, which covers uh, the Wangema Tets block, where we have the biggest elephant concentration probably in the world. And it's our biggest block here in the country. But like I said, that's where we have the biggest concentration of our elephants probably in, 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 the, in, the, in the world or in sub-Saharan Africa, because I'm sure you're aware that's where we have the two-thirds of the remain, which is uh, about uh, 45, between 45 and 53,000, which is um, against an ecological carrying capacity of around uh, 15,000, because the research has shown that one elephant, one square kilometer. We have 14,620 square kilometers in Wange National Park, and not mentioning other like Zambezi National Park, which is around uh, Victoria Falls. And uh, in, in South East Low Field, we're talking of a population of around 11,000, uh, which is also uh, against an ecological, ecological carrying capacity of around five 6,000. So in a nutshell, that's the population. And um, we are eagerly waiting for the Kaza wide uh, elephant census, which was done last year with the help of uh, partners uh, globally. So this Kaza uh, elephant census was mainly looking at the Kavango Zambezi. I'm sure you're aware where the five countries converge, uh, Zimbabwe, uh, Zambia, uh, uh, Botswana, uh, Angola, and, and Namibia. So that whole block, that's where I've said, that's where we have the remaining two thirds of the 400,000 elephants that uh, the world talks about. This is according to World Wildlife uh, Foundation, WWF. Okay, okay. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Farrell, uh, uh, for that uh, informative update. And now, um, as we have seen, uh, Zimbabwe's elephant population has been growing. And uh, this has come with a myriad of problems in a number of ways. Uh, there has been an increase, for example, in human wildlife conflict. How serious has this problem grown? And how has the country sought to address it? Okay, uh, th thank you very much. Uh, I think over the last five, six years, we have witnessed an unprecedented increase in terms of human wildlife conflict. Mainly, uh, it has been increasing because of uh, climate change. I'm sure you're aware that when you talk of climate change, these are the inconsistent with the patterns. Either the, the, the temperatures are extreme or are very low. Rainfall is also, in other ways, extreme or very low. So at the end of the day, because uh, elephants, they rely on water uh, mainly. And uh, in Wange, for an example, where we have the biggest concentration of our elephants, they, we run that part 100% bore water because Wange, uh, normally they don't receive much of the rainfall. So the park is run on 100% bore water. So at some point you'd see that the bores will also run dry because the water table will be going down. So it becomes, it becomes difficult for us to provide water to our animals. The animals will then move into communities in search of water, in search of food. And as the numbers grow, I'm sure you're aware that uh, elephants have a tendency of knocking down trees as they move around. So they also destroy their habitat that they survive on. So there's less food, less water within the park. The animals will then move uh, distances in search of water, in search of food, uh, leading to this conflict. Our communities sometimes will be competing for water with animals, which in most cases becomes uh, dangerous for them. 
uh, they will be trying to scare away the animals from their small gardens because these are the people who are so vulnerable they can't even afford even a morsel of food so they are peasant farmers they rely on their small crops they rely on their small vegetable gardens so when the elephants invade those those communities conflict arises people are killed people are injured we have identified two main um uh, problems especially when it comes to human or life conflict elephants and crocodiles our communities rely on fishing in some cases they'll be crossing rivers to see their relatives in the next village and they are attacked by crocodiles so if you look maybe last year 2022 we lost about 66 lives which was a slight decrease from the previous year 2021 where we lost about 68 and many others, I think 70 people were injured, some with permanent disabilities. And if you look at a five-year period, for example, you'd see that we have lost nearly 500 lives due to human or life conflict. And more than 50% of these attacks, they are attributed to elephants. And almost 90%, the, another 40, 50, uh, we attributed to, to, to crocodiles. And of course, there are also other animals like lions, buffalo, uh, they roam freely. They roam freely. But what is most important to note is that our our animals they are not domesticated. They don't live in fences like what other people think. They roam freely. There are no fences to protect them because the parks are big. The area is big. So because the populations continue to increase, we have always been saying our country is not expanding. But human population is expanding, animal population is expanding, and this conflict is bound to, to happen. So in a nutshell, that's the situation when it comes to human or life conflict. This year alone, I think we've lost more than 15 lives during the first quarter of, of, of 2023, 15. Because the, our people, like I said, they survive on water for fishing, doing carpenter and, and, and other activities. And in some cases, they'll be just crossing a stream to see relatives in the next village or in the next uh, homestead and people lost their life. But most importantly, what we are also doing, we are carrying out a lot of awareness campaigns throughout the country. We are working with the rural district councils, teaching basic things to our communities about animal behavior. What to expect when you see an elephant, what to expect when you see a, a buffalo. Uh, you'd see that, for example, buffaloes, they normally feed in the morning. And during the day, they spend a lot of time in shade uh, or near water sources. So where the animals are, we tell communities, try to avoid movements where there are water sources or in thickets. If you look at these animals, mainly they also move at night. So we tell our people, try to minimize movements at night. Because I think 60 to 50 to 60 percent of the victims they are attacked during the night. So in, in other ways, there's an, a, an imposed curfew on our communities. And I've only mentioned one aspect of the human life conflict, which is loss of life and injuries. We are not mentioning loss of uh, crops, livelihoods, where people, like I said, these are the peas and farmers who survive on growing crops for, for, for their upkeep. Their crops are destroyed. Over the last five years, I think we've lost in more than 10,000 hectares of land which were destroyed by, by, by animals in communities throughout the country. We are, we, if you mention things like livestock, most of these communities, they keep livestock like cattle, goats at their homesteads. And when lions come, they are after those lions. So in other words, we are talking of livelihoods, which is being lost uh, through human wildlife conflict. Mm, quite a disturbing situation, really. Now, uh, Tenashi, apart from the human wildlife conflict, that we have uh, talked about. Um, Zimbabwe as a country has not been spared from the problem of poaching. And um, how has the country uh, sought to confront this issue, the issue of poaching? Okay, uh, th th thank you very much. I think um, if you have uh, been following properly, we have been doing our best in terms of fighting poaching. We work with our judiciary, we work with our police, we work with any other law enforcement agent to an extent that we have laws which are deterrent enough for poachers. For an example, if you are found in possession of an elephant, a task, that's a nine-year mandatory sentence. Right now, the same thing. And to us, I think it's deterrent enough. We work with a lot of partners in the country where we also do a lot of awareness, educating our judicial to, to at least appreciate 
uh, wildlife crimes. And this has been bearing fruit because the, the, the conviction rate has been on the increase over the last three, four years. If you look at, uh, especially since the coming in of um, the directorship of uh, Dr. Photon Mangwani, you'd see that we've devolved power where we are almost in every district and in every uh, village where we work with the roads, where we are not accessible, we have given what we call appropriate authority to road district councils. And this has helped a lot in terms of reaching out to our communities. We also have also increased a lot of law enforcement, anti-poaching anti patrols, working with the communities, because we believe that the communities are the first line of defense. And this has also helped, but most importantly, these communities must also derive some benefit so that they see our life as, a, as an economic opportunity so that they can cooperate with us. If they don't benefit, they will not cooperate. The statistics, for example, over the last three years, we have not lost a single elephant in Wange National Park due to poaching. Of course, we have lost um, rhinos in other parts and, 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 and elephants, of course. But there are two types of poaching. There are people who poach for the poach and those people who poach commercially. And we have managed to plug that. We have also uh, introduced a shoot to kill police. If you are found within a national park with a rifle, you'll be shot on site. And we've managed to recover a lot of rifles within the parks. We've also managed to recover a lot of ammunition. We've managed to arrest a lot of people, hundreds of them, and most of them have been convicted. Like I said, the conviction rate is very high and we are pleased. And of course, we are not saying the problems are not there. They are still there, but we are working closely with a lot of uh, government departments and also conservation partners. If you look at this year's theme for World Wildlife Day, it was uh, it was a partnership for, world, for wildlife conservation. These partnerships, we value them. There are people who help us with fuel, some who help us with vehicles, some also help us with tents for our rangers because they spent 21 days on extended patrols in the bush moving around, looking after our animals. So every time when people talk of the numbers that we, have, that we have as a country, it's not an accident of history, it's a result of good management practices that we have instituted as a, as a, as a department and as a country to show the importance of wildlife. But in, unfortunately, this, is, this, this, this success story is a pain to us is hating us because our people are killed, our people are injured, they're losing their crops, and we have nothing to show. That's why it also sometimes becomes difficult to convince the communities to alert the authorities when poachers are around. But we we'll continue to push, we we'll continue to work with those who want to work with us to see the value of wildlife so that our communities can benefit, so that we can build schools, clinics, roads, and ensure that our people, we, there are jobs, improve their life laws. There are a lot of things that we can do as a country, especially where we do crops. I mean, we need to convince our people that we can do away with cropping or livestock, um, um, uh, or livestock uh, business and do wildlife because there's money into it. So they must see wildlife as an economic opportunity. Thank you very much, Dinesh, for that insightful um, information. Now. Uh, as we continue to look at the uh, issue at hand here, we have uh, the issue of uh, environmental sustainability and conservation. Um, how has uh, your department and uh, Zimbabwe as a country in particular um, uh, dealt with this issue, um, the issue of environmental sustainability and conservation? You see, uh, there have been calls by some quarters in the past for the country to introduce culling of elephants. Uh, is this an issue uh, with the Zimbabwe government at the moment? Okay, uh, thank you very much. Let me start with the issue of culling. Um, uh, Zimbabwe last did culling in, in the 1980s, 87, 88, thereabouts. So we haven't done culling over the last 30 years, mainly because of the noise that we get, especially from the West. People who are not on the ground, they don't know what our communities are going through, they just make noise from them because they think it's cruel. But the uh, culling was a way of controlling the populations. It has been done successfully. It's a research based, and but we haven't done that because of that kind of pressure. But uh, the issue of sustainably uh, managing our wildlife, I think we've, we've done extremely well from the 
first gazetting of the of the first park in this country, which was in 1928, Wange National Park was gazetted as a, a national park. But that doesn't mean that it was not a park before. It was a park before, but it was not gazetted because our people used to use it as a hunting and play, especially for the Ndebele people. And so park, parks were already there, but 1928 started being gazetted. We used to hunt, we used to, that's how we used to live as a people, as, a, as, 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 as our history. But what then happened, I'm glad to say, since that part was... Thank you so much. Uh, now, we will go to an issue related uh, to that. Um, for some time in the past, Zimbabwe has uh, been trying to lobby the international bodies like uh, CITES to be allowed to trade uh, in ivory and elephant products, especially with regard to seized uh, ivory. Um, uh, is this an issue with the Zimbabwean government? And what challenges have you faced in that regard? Oh, okay, thank you very much. This is a there's a there's a huge challenge and there's a gap on how we as Africans in general or how we as Zimbabweans in particular view wildlife and how uh, people from the West view wildlife. Some people, because they don't have them, they think we don't have them too. So when they see it, they develop an attachment, a sentiment of value. They don't want to be realistic. Every decision that we've made as a, as a government is science-based. It's based on research, it's based on science. So it's important to look at it that way. But the biggest challenge, like I said, is people who have never been to Zimbabwe, who have never been to Africa. There are people who don't even know how an elephant looks like. They've never seen an elephant. They make decisions in some air-conditioned office in Sydney, in Australia, or in London, or in New York. They are not on the ground. They don't know how it feels to compete for water with, 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 with elephants. They don't know how it feels. You spend the whole night, uh, lions roaring, and you know the next day you want to send your children to school or you want to send your children to head cattle. It's a traumatic experience that our people are going through. So when these people make these decisions, we've always been invited them to see, come and see for yourselves so that you can have an appreciation of what we are going through as a country. We have mentioned the issue of our communities going through those hardships. And we are simply saying, let's create value from this wildlife. Let's create, let's let our people see animals as an economic opportunity for their survival, for creation of jobs, for employment creation, for 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 for, jo for, for, for infrastructure roads. And this this has been our clarion call. But unfortunately, unfortunately, there are people we I mean I've met people who have never seen an elephant in their life. But they are making decisions on behalf of people who are competing for water with this. Uh, and if you look over the last cities, over the last few years, we've been trying to push to have a communities uh, section. Like there's an, a plants and animals uh, commit. We also try to say, let's have a community uh, commit where communities discuss the issues that affect them, issues that they go through every day in their life so that we can also drive some value. There's been an argument, of course, that if uh, we open up the market, um, it will increase poaching. There's no evidence to that. Rhino won't say there's been banned since 1975. It has not stopped rhino poaching. In fact, it was on the increase. Because if you look at the poaching wave which swept across the continent in the 80s or early 90s, it almost uh, wiped out the species. But the, the, the ban is there. Elephant task trade has been banned since 1989, but it's not stopping. So we are simply saying, let's create value, let's create opportunities, let's create jobs. I mean, a lot of things that we can do so that we can also help our people, we can also protect our resources. Wildlife conservation is an expensive business. It needs money, it needs resources. I've given you an example of um, our officers who go on patrol, Are you an African student studying journalism and communication? Are you a student of photojournalism? 
Are you someone interested in creative writing? Are you interested in building your community while sharpening your writing skills, interacting and rub shoulders with some of the best writers around? If your answer is yes, please contact us outlining and specifying your area of interest and specialization. Jericho Media, the home of Quedu Classics. Your story, our story. Most of the, uh, in fact, most of the evil that we have comes from natural mortality, the elephants that would have died. And very few, um, I should have just maybe uh, uh, got the numbers for you in terms of percentage, how many do we get from poachers? The recoveries are not as many as we are made to believe. Most of these animals are from natural mortality. We, we take them, we put them in a store, and they are kept safe. If you get any ivory piece today in our ivory stockpile, if you punch the number that is there, uh, you, you'll be told what was the cause of the death for that elephant or rhino. Where did it die? When? How old was it? It's all computerized. So there's no way this thing can end up in, in wrong hands, especially if you do it properly. Oh, amazing, amazing. Oh, thank you very much for that. Um, now, uh, let's go to an issue here, uh, which uh, most of our viewers, I think, would also want to understand. We have had reports uh, of uh, trophy hunters uh, that the Zimbabwean government, uh, uh, periodically, they give license to some um, trophy hunters. Um, and uh, we've had reports that, that uh, the, the trophy hunters, mainly from the United States of America. Now, um, our research has shown that, um, uh, that there's a Reuters report in two of 2007 that actually said, um, uh, it cited the United States of America as one of the top countries where illegal trade in ivory uh, was taking place. Now, if you look at this decision to award licenses or uh, to trophy hunters, mainly from the United States of America. Does this not humble the country um, efforts to combat poaching and illegal trade in ivory? And is it okay. coincidental that we have mainly uh, uh, trophy hunters from the U.S.? Okay, Th thank you very much. It is, indeed, um, in terms of our hunting, the United States of America is a very big market. Uh, in terms of people who come to do trophy hunting. But if you look at it, we have a hunting quota for elephants of 500 since 1991. We have never exhausted that hunting quota. The highest that we did, I think, is around 280 something on the turn of the millennium. So elephants which are hunted legally in Zimbabwe, they are about, I mean, at most 300, like I said. So the 300 elephants, and not many of them would want to take the trophies to 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 their to their to their countries. So when people say some of these things, it's not informed on science. It's based on emotions. It's based on politics. It's based on things which we some of us can't even explain, because 500 to take out 500 elephants in Wanga National Park is a drop in the ocean. It will not be felt because the the population is too big. But we do that through a research process, through a hunting quota, where parties come together, our scientists come together, our researchers come together to see how best we can do that. So it's a science-based decision which we do and we carry out diligently. Uh, from that hunting quota since 1991, we have been consistent. And it's a result of that process that, I, that I've explained, the hunting quota, to see how many we can harvest, how many we cannot harvest, and why are we harvesting this number here in this near this safari area and, 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 and other. So it's, it, there's no link on that, on, on, on illegal trade of uh, rhino, of elephant tusks in the U.S. and what is happening here in, 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 in Zimbabwe. But it's not... Uh... I sort of see a contradiction there. Um, isn't uh, uh, what was the difference between trophy hunting 
and Kali. It is indeed a contradiction. Okay, of, of I know. On there's the, no on okay, the part there's, of, okay, 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 okay. There, 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 okay, in Zimbabwe, there we have two types of hunting, two types of tourism. Sorry, there's what we call photographic tourism, where people come, they go on a game drive vehicle, they see the animals, they take pictures within the park, they pay a fee for that. And there's what we call a consumptive or trophy hunting or sport hunting. Where tourists come, they go to a safari, not a national park. National parks, no hunting takes place there. So because the animals, they know no boundary, they move freely to farms near national parks. It's a well-planned thing. So they go there, they identify the size of an animal which can make a good trophy. If it lions, you look at the age. There are certain ages that we can hunt. For an example, females are not hunted, so that we can also create. So that's 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 the trophy hunting. It's sport hunting where people spend 21 days. And don't look at it as just hunting. Those people, when they come, they want transport, they want food, they want accommodation. It's a whole industry that we are talking about. We're not talking of a small industry. So when people talk of like what Britain is doing, trying to, to, to ban uh, uh, trophies into the United Kingdom, it's, it's, and besides, UK contributes about 5% of, of, of hunting revenue in this country. They're a small player. But they are trying to influ influence big players. You know, they are, their alliance, they, the Western alliance. They, they are a small player. They can't even... You know what? I don't know how best can I put it. The United Kingdom is a small player in terms of hunting. But they want to set a wrong precedent with other countries. So coming back to the issue of... Truth, so so that, that's what happens. So it's an industry on its own. Thousands are employed in that industry. So when you talk of a 5 billion tourism, a 5 billion dollar tourism economy in this country. These are the things that we are talking about. These are the employment opportunities that we are talking about. These are the things that people do when they come. They want to drink, they want to drive, they want to enjoy themselves away from the pressure. For example, it's going to one day hunt. It's money that we are talking about. These are jobs that we are talking about. So yeah, that's that's what that's that's the trophy hunting that we're talking about. And then culling is a deliberate deliberate uh, uh, elimination of animals in their numbers because you know elephants they move in families so you can wipe out the whole family so that you can control you can control the population when trophy hunting i don't think it can manage to control uh, the, our elephant population because the number that we use for 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 for, for the, the permits that we give for trophy hunting they are they are too small the number just 500 it's not much and throughout okay. the country out of a population of about 80 to 100,000 What's, you can do the maze. What's the percentage of that? Yeah, it's, it's very negligible. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, now uh, Chinashi, uh, that, that takes us to an issue related to what you've just been explaining, uh, the issue of for revenue or for Zimbabwe, for the Zimbabwean economy. To what level is the Zimbabwean economy benefiting from its prowling elephant population? Say, uh, uh, annually or perhaps in the past five years, is Zimbabwe benefiting from its uh, uh, elephant population? I've, I've, I think I've recently explained about uh, our two types of tourism that we practice in Zimbabwe. We are talking of jobs here. We are talking of infrastructure development. We are talking of schools, hospitals that are built throughout life. But unfortunately, because of COVID over the last three years, most of our tourists, 60, I think 60% of our tourists were coming from Europe and America and Asia. In fact, that was the, way for the majority of tourists who come to Zimbabwe, they were foreigners. When people come to Zimbabwe, they are coming to see wildlife. Our tourism is wildlife based. So wildlife is a major drawcard for tourists across the globe. You cannot see any other six ton elephant anywhere else in the world besides seeing it in Zimbabwe. You cannot see a, another major draw card of a rhino, a wild, you know, a, a, a unspoiled wildlife, a, a, not domesticated, not in zoos, elephants that, that can move, roam freely across the length and breadth of the country. So that's our major draw card. 
our revenue, of course, has gone down because of COVID and we've been facing a lot of challenges in terms of looking after that resource. But all things being equal, tourism, the 5 billion tourism economy that we're talking about, is mainly based on wildlife. That's why we have been emphasizing on creating value from wildlife so that our people can see a wildlife as an economic opportunity. It's something that we can rely on, not as... Um, is uh, what I don't know, but uh, that's that's what it is. That's what we look. Um, as we conclude, I'm sure you and me agree that um, um, Zimbabwe's elephant population is ever increasing, and uh, it's unsustainable. Almost, exactly, it's actually dangerously increasing now, mm. and uh, generally, people, be it locally or internationally, people are talking. People are saying it. People agree that something ought to be done. But no one really knows what exactly has to be done. No one, uh, the, the people can't come to an agreement, really, as to what is to be done. But people are saying something needs to be done. Now, uh, in your opinion, uh, what is the way forward as far as the uh, Zimbabwe elephant uh, uh, situation is concerned? What is the way forward? Uh, 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 history has taught us not once, not twice, but times dot number what needs to be done. We know what needs to be done, but what we need to do is being resisted by people who are not affected by the same situation. Imagine if you can take 2,000 elephants, we give it to Australia, they can roam freely in Sydney. It's too possible. They can come and take them, and then you, you guys, will also be interacting with those, with those, with those animals freely. So the whole, the, the, what we need to do is to depopulate where we have more elephants to where we have less elephants. But it's an expensive process. We have done that in 2018, 2019, where we moved about 100 elephants from south, southeast Lofield to some areas where the populations were. Way, 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 way low. We can do that with even with other countries, depopulating to former elephant ranges across the continent or across the world because the numbers are not sustainable. The animals are slowly becoming a danger unto themselves. They are destroying their own habitat. They are kill and they are not only affecting only their habitat, they are also affecting other animals' habitat. Like, for example, vouchers, they can only breed in certain tree heights. Now, because the animals knock down trees are, are with this, they move around, they are breeding cycle. There's a research to that effect. If you go to Manapus, for example, it used to have a lot of baobab trees. But because baobab trees are a favorite sp a tree species or food species for animals, they are facing extinction of baobab trees. If you go to Gunarejo, same story. If you go to Wange, the acacia tree, you can hardly see a young acacia tree. Because the animals are destroyed. So, while at least we are looking at, assuming that it's a, it's a, it's a, we are not important, the black can just die, it's okay. But what about the vegetation? What about the habitat that we are losing? So, that's the way forward, and that's what we think needs to be done. People, especially from the West, they must come and see for themselves so that they can make informed decisions. Researches have been done several times, times that number on what needs to be done to deal with the elephant population in this part of the world, in Zimbabwe in particular and in Southern Africa in general. Like I said, I'm sure you're aware, that's where we have two thirds of the remaining 400,000 elephants in the world. Now, I'm very happy and I have the pleasure to introduce to you Mr. Eric Zai. Mr. Eric Zai is the operations manager here at Unlock Park. Mr. Eric. Uh, can you tell us, also tell our viewers or in Peru Classics, why they should come to Anglo Park? What, what's special about Anglo Park? What's special about this place? Thank you so much, Eric. Uh, my name is uh, Eric Zai. I'm the operations manager here at Anglo Park. As the name suggests, Anglo Park, uh, one might need to know what do we mean by Anglo. Okay? An Anglo it's a group of animals uh, like impalas, your kudus, your wildebeest, uh, to mention but a few. That's what we call by antelope. So at Antelope Park, we do have a variety of animals. We do have the elephants uh, on our background. So these are the only four elephants that we have here at Antelope Park. And the reason why we have only these four elephants is that the park is too small. It's just 
comprise of a 3,000 acre land, so it cannot accommodate more than this number that we have. And apart from that, we also have 60 lions that we have here at Anlo Park. Wow, um, 60 and lions? 60 lions indeed. That's a lion's I'd like to um, talk to our viewers that we are more into land conservation. That's our core, with the understanding that we understand that whatever we have, every resort that we have in our country is not an inheritance from our forefathers, but we borrowed everything from the future generations, which means we always have to sustain the little that we have. So, and also apart from the lions, we do have uh, other animals like giraffes, and we do have wildebeest, we do have zebras, we do have impalas, we do have kudus. So coming to Anlo Park is all fulfilling. Seeing the elephants, and then with the lions, uh, seeing the giraffes, uh, to mention but a few, it's amazing. Wow, 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 beautiful. Uh, Anlo Park, if you come to Zimbabwe, that's the place to be. Indeed, it is. It's, it's a full house. It is. Package of everything, all in one. Beautiful, beautiful. There we are. You heard it from the horse's mouth. Everything is here. Everything is happening here. This is where everything is happening. This is the place to be. See you then. Thank you so much. Thank you, Harry. Africa's elephant population has been dangerously declining, but not in Zimbabwe. These elephants are multiplying at a dangerous rate of 5% per annum. The Parks and Wildlife Agency Director General Fulton Mangwanya said in 2020. The surplus has prompted the government of Zimbabwe in recent years to move the mass killing of elephants, something the country last did in 1988, as a population control option in order to protect other wildlife as well as the country's vegetation. Zimbabwe has for some time been seeking support to be allowed to sell its stockpile of seized ivory, saying the 600 million it expects to earn is urgently needed for the conservation of its rapidly growing elephant population, which it describes as dangerous. Thus, as the debate rages on, it remains difficult to find common ground and consensus on how best to address the elephant situation in Zimbabwe. One thing is certain though, something ought to be done, and done as a matter of agency. But at the moment, no one agrees on what needs to be done. <laughs>